Great. Hi, uh, I'm Helena Brock. I work uh, in Music Norway. I've been giving the honor on behalf of Nomex, the Nordic Music Export Offices, to welcome you to today's discovery session to Brazil. Uh, I hope you are ready to embrace the opportunities that lies within this vivid music market, which we're about to get more insight into. Uh, a market with a very strong local music scene and sound, and with a very wide, wide global reach. Uh, Brazil is a very attractive market for many reasons. Uh, it's one of the fastest growing when it comes to streaming, and it's a great live market. Uh, a country that loves to consume music. We are so very thankful to Luciana, who puts this program together for us. Uh, she'll be the guide uh, and guide us through this next hours. Uh, I'd also like to, uh, to extend a thank you to the other speakers that uh, has set aside time to share their knowledge with us. Luciana, I'll pass on the screen to you. Thank you, Helene. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon to you all. Hope you enjoy our presentation. Uh, I'm going to run the, the webinar with you today with uh, uh, several guests. Um, sorry, there's some background noise here. So I'm going to start with a very broad overview on Brazil. And then I'll pass on to David, which will go more into the specifics of the music market. So I'm going to share my screen. to the presentation. Can you see the presentation? Okay. Okay, so about Brazil, I know you Norwegians know a lot about geography, because this is a presentation we usually do to Americans, but it's always important to get to know a, a view of uh, how big Brazil is. Uh, Brazil is a continental country. It's in almost like South America. Uh, it's the only country in South America that speaks Portuguese. So we have 12 Hispanophone countries and Brazil speaks Portuguese. Uh, this is very important because most of the uh, Many foreigners do not know this uh, specific thing. And for us, it's very important because it makes a big difference in the Brazilian um, culture. It's very separated from the other countries because of the, the, our foundation and because we were colonized by Portuguese and the other countries by Spanish. So that makes us a very uh, different culture from the other countries in the continent. And you, you see from the music business side how that, how that is uh, complicated, in fact. So we are a huge population, over to, to 100 million people and counting. Every week you see more numbers on that. So, um, our cons consumption base is very big, and that's why that's what makes our music market very um, important and very and huge. In spite of the pandemic, uh, we had a, a interesting growth in in the last year. We grew 4.6 percent, representing almost two trillion dollars. It was the biggest growth since 2010. Of course, we had a drastic uh, down uh, because of the pandemic, but then the country showed it is um, strong enough to grow again and, and to, to have a very, very important growth uh, the last year. And it's still growing and the, the uh, forecasts are, are very positive for this year as well. In terms of uh, music numbers, the, the IFPI numbers uh, from 2021, the world grew 18.5%, that meaning 25, almost $26 billion in revenue in the music market. 
and Brazil grew 32%, was the, the country with the highest growth in the region. South America is the highest growth in the world, and Brazil had the highest growth last year, um, comparing to the other countries. So we grew 32% and over $400 million in revenues just for the IFPI numbers, because we have other very important numbers here on public performance rights that we'll see uh, in the next slide. So we had the highest growth in two decades. This is the public performance rights uh, revenue. You see it, it's always uh, on average 1 billion reais. We, we had a fall in 2020 because of the pandemic and the live scene that was not working. But even so, we we managed. We had uh, our public performance system is very unique in the world, and it's very um, very competent. They really work well, and they manage to to compensate the losses from the live scene with other revenues, especially the digital and and other things that they they manage to to do and we had a during the pandemic we had the, the highest uh, numbers on on um, online performance concerts and some of them were sponsored so we had some revenue coming from there too and in, in 2021 it went back to the average uh, amount of 1 billion reais um, for only for public performance rights. The DSPs today um, have 13, over 13 million subscribers in Brazil. Spotify is by far the highest one with 62%. And then we, ha we have the other ones, Amazon Music, Deezer, Apple Music, YouTube Music, others uh, title we have some local dsps but they mainly work with uh, brazilian music and this is the the uh, these numbers are sort of old they're from a comparison between 2018 and 2019 q4 those were the closest numbers i could find to show to you Now, this is very important for you to know about the Brazilian culture. As Brazil is very, is huge, it's a continental country. Uh, we have five regions. It's almost like we had, uh, like you guys have in Europe, each country, each state in Brazil could be like a country because everyone speaks the same language, but the accents are very different and the local cultures are very different too. The music people listen to, the habits, the food, the even the dressing and, and the landscape, everything in each country is so unique that you can almost think it's a different countries in, in the same country, within the same country. Of course, there is a, a culture that unites us all, the, the language unites us all, our origins and all of that. But this information is important because when you travel to Brazil, you feel that difference. You, you see uh, Brazilians are very much like, even funny, uh, because we all, we all look like we could be from any place in the world. Like you have lots of Japanese, you have uh, blonde and white people, you have brunettes, you have uh, Asian type people, you have all types of types of people because of the uh, influx of immigration since the since we're, we were a colony from Portugal. So uh, any person in the world could be Brazilian, but actually not because you, you see the, the Brazilians they when when i travel abroad for example 
um, people know I'm Brazilian. So it's, it's weird. It's like you, we have a, a vibe, like some, uh, I don't know how to explain. I don't know if it's the smile, the way of behaving among people, um, the way we, we, we speak or whatever, it, you know when a, a person is, is a Brazilian. But inside the country, we see all those differences in accents, in type of music that, that people like in different regions. Uh, so this is important. Music is consumed differently in each region. International music is more consumed in the South East and South regions, which are those here in, in red and yellow. The other parts of the country are people listen more to Brazilian music and much more to a specific type of Brazilian music, which is sort of a country music, a North American country music type of, uh, we call it certain Asia. It's a, the most consumed music in the country today. And since one or two decades decade to now. So, here we see um, distribution by neighboring rights. Uh, this slide just to, so, so that you know how the percentage of music consumed in Brazil of uh, foreign music and Brazilian music. So th the numbers on the top, uh, this is the percentage of distribution of rights for international music. And on the bot bottom is the Brazilian music. So you see from two, uh, 2017 until 2020, um, a growth in the consumption of international music. Most of the international music consumed in Brazil are in English language. And today with the streaming, you, you, it's easier for you to find your consumption niche, like your, your listeners, from, you, you can find listeners from uh, other languages, but it's more rare. It's, it's easier to, to break uh, in the country speaking English. So you, you get into this international percentage of music consumption. Some trends, and, and this will be uh, going deeper on this with the next presentations and, and the debate after that, but just for you to have a overall idea. Um, for promotion, the trends for promotion in Brazil, it's probably the same everywhere else, but in Brazil specifically, influencers, digital influencers are the most used today, most effective way to, to get people to listen to your music. Uh, short videos, are especially those with humor are very interesting too. People here love me memes and short videos of humor. So most many of the uh, especially the young people consumption and and music discovery is coming from TikTok, mostly because of these short videos and because the the young people are very much uh, within TikTok. And memes as well, people in Brazil like a lot. And Instagram is always also very used for promotion of everything in Brazil and music as well. And for artist discovery, TikTok, as I said, is where the, uh, the young people are. Uh, music festivals are very important too. There are Lots and lots of music festivals in Brazil. We'll speak more about that in the debate session. And sync is also uh, a, a strong market in Brazil. Movies, TV series, ads. There's a whole market for um, music sync in, in Brazil. And this market is very um, strong and People earn a lot of money from that. And people discover artists a lot with the, um, by watching movies and series 
and also the commercials on television, especially. I didn't talk about radio uh, here because uh, radio is, is still in, in Brazil a way for people to, to uh, get to know about some music and, and especially to, um, how do I say, radio, it sets the, the importance of the music. If, if it's very difficult to get on, on radio, especially the commercial radios, terrestrial and commercial radios, but if you get to the radio, that sets the importance of your music, that almost tells people that your music is, is uh, top, is mainstream, is, is important, and people are listening to it. So, but it's not, it's very difficult to get to radio, but it's still a important way of music consumption um, and of artist discovery in Brazil, terrestrial radios and online radios as well. But we have strong chains of radio in Brazil still. I don't know how it is in, in Norway. The biggest DSPs for music consumption in Brazil are YouTube and Spotify. Um, especially the YouTube, the video platform, not, not YouTube music. And Spot, Spotify, especially the free, uh, the free plans, the free Spotify. Well, that was just a overall, um, just for you to have an idea of the overall market in Brazil. I'm head of Trans Brazil Conference. It's run from October 19 to 21 in Rio de Janeiro. And I'm co-founder of Kickoff Music. We work with NFTs, Metaverse, and all the, the Web3 things. This is my uh, email address. And um, I am, I'll be your consultants for Brazil as well on the months to come if you need any specific things after this conference. So I end up a bit early, but I think you, David has a lot to tell about all of this. I don't know if you wanna, Elaine, open for, for five or 10 minutes of questions on this overall uh, information on Brazil, or let's jump to David's presentation straight ahead. Uh, I'm not sure, sorry, Rosa here. Um, I'm not sure if he's, he's uh, ready at this moment. Are you there, David? Let me see. He is. He is, there you go. I'm ready, guys. I love talking. Oh, beautiful. <laughs> uh, yeah, he'll talk more than me. <laughs> and I'm special. If anyone has any questions, please um, raise your hands or yeah, let us know. Or you can write okay. in the chat also, and then we can have a look uh, when people, when David or Luciana are able to answer. Yeah, David will go deeper on those informations for you, but just if you, if you have any, any questions so far uh, on this overall presentation, we'll be happy to answer. If not, we'll jump to David's presentation. I think uh, Alejandro has one, one question. Yeah. You guys hear Hello, me? Alejandro. Hi, yes. nice to meet you. Uh, how is the Spanish music in Brazil? It's um, less than, than English music in Brazil. We, we've, we have uh, historically a difficulty with the Spanish speaking uh, countries, but we do listen to some, some music in Spanish, especially those artists that become uh, mainstream and very famous uh, like Mana, Alejandro Sanz, uh, those artists, but, but most of the international music consumed in Brazil is in English. 
After that, uh, we could say Spanish, but the majority is really in English. All right, okay, thank you. Okay, let me talk. So I'm Irish. I'm with David McLaughlin. I've lived in Brazil for almost 30 years. Yeah. I'll just I'll just give you a little background of where I've come from and how I sort of developed and learned how to work in the local market. Um, I, I originally lived in London. I worked in Tower Records in Piccadilly Circus, uh, selling CDs and LPs, importing music, LPs and CDs from Brazil to sell in the UK. Uh, I arrived in Brazil and I worked for seven or eight different independent music companies. Um, our market was principally Brazilian music, okay? We would release a lot of regional Brazilian music. And like Luciana was saying, you can look upon Brazil as different territories. So we'd have different styles of music that we could sell a million in their own territory and it would be unknown outside other states. Yeah? Uh, internet has changed that a lot, but you can still look upon Brazil as a regional country. There are regional styles of music, local cultures that are only consumed in their states and that they don't really export to other, other states. Um, so our focus was mainly, because of the market and because of money, selling Brazilian music. Okay, we did, uh, we would release 10, 15 albums every month. I worked for a few international companies. One was called Some Records, and we had licensing deals with labels like Beggar's Banquet, 4AD, XL, Cooking Vinyl, Roadrunner. So we were releasing a lot of artists like White Stripes, um, Peaches, Echo and the Bunny Men. And because it was the CD, era, we, we were exporting to all of South America. We had a good export, export system work, working up. Uh, like I say, it, it, still, it was still a, a small niche market um, because again, Brazil really consumes a lot of its own music. International music wasn't such a big deal here. The major labels here would release artists like Metallica, uh, Iron Maiden, Eric Clapton, all those, all those big names. Uh, in the mid 90s, late 90s, uh, there was a kind of an increase in independent record labels here. We had labels like, like some records where I worked with Trauma, uh, Indie, Deck Disc, and so on, uh, Lab. And a lot of these companies were releasing international music. They were doing licensing deals, they would go to international trade fairs and license stuff and release here. It was mainly an act of love, okay? It wasn't a big commercial venture. Like you would, you would get, your, get your profit for the record company on releasing quantities of albums, okay? So we'd, you know, if you're releasing five, 10 albums every few months, you were, you were getting your profit on that. Um, um, so I, I worked a fair few years with these labels. Um, my first contact with the internet world was working with The Orchard here in Brazil. And that was from the only, we didn't even have iTunes, we had nothing in Brazil. Uh, people looked upon giving your music to the orchard and so on as a, as a licensing deal. Uh, and that's, there was, you know, you license your music and you receive your money back. And at the end of the first year, people got pissed off. They said, where's my money? Uh, I license my music to you, because like you license a CD, you sell at least a thousand CDs. So people said, ah, I license my music for di digital, where's my money? And so it took a while for people to understand that you had to market and promote your music online to begin to, to generate a result. Um, I spent a few years working with the export office and one of our models was based on the models you have in Norway and Sweden. Uh, really, I love that idea of different countries working together. Uh, we tried to do partnerships with other countries in South America, with Mexico, Colombia, Bolivia and so on. Like Luciana says, Spanish music is known, but it's not really consumed in great quantities here. Uh, uh, there is an effort, like I remember sort of, Brazil is like the lost cousin of the Hispanic market. Everybody knows that Brazil is there, 
but they 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 work far better together. Argentina, there, there are a lot, a lot of music conferences and so on, like Circle Art and so on, where they all meet up together. And Brazil is, to a certain extent, not excluded, but we're not totally part of this yet. Uh, some of the music conferences, especially in the north of Brazil, are trying to make an effort to embrace sort of the, the, the rest of the, of the Spanish language market. Um, so I set up a service, after the export office, I set up a service called Brazil Calling, which was basically using all the international contacts I have, press and radio and so on, to send them every month new Brazilian music. And we've now expanded that to start inc including music from, from Mexico, uh, Spanish language music. And we're also now doing the opposite, which is getting international music and bringing it into Brazil, sending to blogs and radio and so on. So last year I started working with uh, Horus Music, which is uh, an independent distributor in the UK. How's my English? My English is okay. Everybody can understand properly? Uh, good. Okay. So I started working with Horus Music in the UK. And so we've been doing exactly that. We've been bringing international music into Brazil, okay, and trying to find where the spaces are for this type of music. So one act we, we worked with a few months ago is Morgan Heritage. So Morgan Heritage is a big reggae band from Jamaica. They've been around for maybe 15, 20 years. So they're almost like sort of the second generation of the band, sort of the children of the, of the parents are now performing in the band. And so reggae is popular in Brazil, but it's still a very niche market. Uh, so we had to identify, you know, how and where we could, we could put this music. Um, so we reached out directly to a lot of blogs in Brazil. And the, the, there are a lot of blogs within Brazil, um, small independent blogs. Uh, some are just focused really on Brazilian music, but some also embrace sort of lots of international styles as well. Um, and we got good, good coverage with them. A difficulty with some blogs is that they want to sell advertising, okay? They, because a lot, a lot of them are journalists and they live off this, okay? So they need either a sponsor or advertising. So it's kind of like sort of payola sometimes in radio stations. You need to sort of make an investment in some of these blogs, do some type of, type of advertising with them. And in exchange, you're going to get uh, coverage with them on the on their site. Uh, it's and I've had the same experience like abroad as well. Like sort of even sending music, even to things like Rolling Stone or Jazzwise or, or Downbeat Jazz Magazine. They'll say, "Oh, fantastic! Can you do advertising?" Yeah, uh, because they're, they're no longer selling physical copies, so they need other other other, other revenue forms. Um, so within our niche, Mark Morgan Heritage did really well. Okay, we couldn't get them on any playlists. Uh, but we got them a lot of local press and a lot, a lot of local independent radio stations. We also started working with uh, collaborations. Um, and collaborations are a big, healthy form of getting into the Brazilian market. Um, a lot of, like, sort of, we have the, our most famous artist in Brazil at the moment, Anita. She does a lot of collaborations with artists in the States uh, to try and get into the, into the US market. Uh, in Brazil, we've had artists like uh, Vanessa da Mata, who's like a big sort of singer-songwriter type artist, recording with uh, Ben Harper. Uh, and that was a massive success, and it still gets a lot, a lot of airplay here all the time. Um, and it also was an interesting crossover, because a lot of radio stations that would only broadcast Brazilian music, Portuguese language music, started including this song that has Ben Harper also singing in English. Yeah? It's not being nationalistic or anything, but you know, the, the preference is always to have, you know, uh, Brazil, Brazil, Brazilian Portuguese language songs. Uh, we've just started doing a project with uh, Lee John. I don't know if anybody remembers the band Imagination from the 80s in the UK. They had a song called Just an Illusion, it was a very sort of disco, disco pop music. So we have Lee John recording with George Versilo. George Versilo, so Lee John is a very romantic soul type singer in the UK. Uh, George Versilo, and Luciano will probably not agree, but he's kind of like a George Michael type singer in Brazil. Um, he's um, slightly soul, romantic type music going on all the time. So we've spent about a year and a half 
developing, we haven't released the music yet, but it's just one track. Uh, we did a video. The video was horrible. Yeah? At the beginning, we thought it was fantastic. We worked it out, whatever. Uh, we showed it to people in Brazil because the, the, the video was recorded by people in the UK. And they have a UK mentality. And we showed it to the Brazilians. And the Brazilians say, David, this is really bad because and they had a list of reasons and so on. So it took a while for us to show the people in the UK to trust the Brazilian feeling. They said, you know, this is how, you, this is how it's going to work in Brazil. There's no point in coming and saying, this is the way we want to present ourselves. They said, you have to sort of make some, some adaptations for, for the Brazilian market. Um, and we're, you know, we're, we're still putting, putting the project together. Yeah? Um, because also, because it's an important project, so we, we have to analyze how much money are we going to spend on radio, okay? Uh, to what extent will George Versilo be able to make an impact on social media in Brazil? Uh, uh, does he have a proper presence here in Brazil on Facebook and Instagram and, and, and Twitter? Uh, uh, we've had a few chats with Kwai, along with TikTok. Kwai from China has now become one of the big sort of short video formats here in Brazil. Kwai, Kwai was originally focused on more adult topics, like not like sex or anything, but sort of adults, you know, the adult world, not sort of teenage world. Um, and the, the local music manager of Kwai is a guy called Fabrizio Nobri. So Fabrizio has worked a lot with hard rock, heavy metal music and so on. Uh, he's participated in lots of international music conferences. And so he's very tuned in to, to, trying to trying to create activities that will stimulate and help the independent music sector, both here in Brazil and abroad as well. He likes that sort of idea of sort of collaborating and bringing people together. Um, it's worthwhile uh, downloading the Quai app. Like, so I think last year it was the number one downloaded app in Brazil, KWAI. Um, and Kwai are, in, are at the moment traveling around Brazil. They're, they're recording special videos with different artists and so on, and do, doing some interesting stuff. Um, also, I, do, I had a, a coronavirus about three months ago, so it wiped me out. So every now and then the voice just starts to, to disappear. Um, we, we, through Horus, our distributor, we also released last week a song by a Canadian artist. Uh, uh, it was a song called Eshu, which was based on African candomblé religious culture. And it was a beautiful video recorded with, uh, with an animation company in Nigeria. It had a special Brazilian vibe to it. Nobody has ever heard of the artist here in Brazil in their lives. So she was totally unknown here. So the same thing, we tried to understand how can we identify where her public is here within Brazil, okay? So the, the, the Camden Bay culture has a special link, like, for example, to, to Bahia. Not exclusively, but a special link there. So we basically reached out to, to WhatsApp groups in Bahia. So we would send them directly uh, 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 YouTube links. We put together a mailing list of about 2,000 Brazilian musicians and artists, uh, who, especially who, who are involved in Black Brazilian culture. And same thing, we sent them directly, direct links to, for them to listen to the, and watch the video clip exclusively. Um, that resulted in, in us, the first weekend having 3,000 plays, and by the end of the week having over 100,000 plays of the track. And our biggest public was in the USA, where the singer already has a, has a public. But our second biggest public was within Brazil, okay? So it was like what we call like sort of Chinese torture, just drips, drips, drips. There was, n there was no financial investment involved in it, in terms of like buying media and so on. But it was directly reaching out to artists, directly sort of looking at sort of Facebook groups and so on, and reaching out and talking directly to these people. Uh, um, so that's kind of what I'm doing at the moment. Um, so let me look at some of my notes here. Um, so Luciana has the, the, the trends conference in Rio de Janeiro. 
the number one method for me of, of getting into the Brazilian market is participating in the local music conferences, okay? Uh, I've always believed totally, sort of like sort of, especially because now, because I'm getting old as well, but I always believe totally sort of in networking and friendships. Uh, and I've been going to events like South by Southwest and Canadian Music Week and Mead and, and Womex and so on over the years. And you're going to do business, but you're also going because you, you, you have friends there. Yeah? It usually takes, I don't know how many people sort of have already, already participated in the, in the international music conferences. Yeah? But it usually takes maybe three years. It takes sort of the first year you go there and you're, you're beginning to understand who people are. The second year, you're now aware of what happens in the event. And the third year, you're, you're part of the gang. Uh, people now know who you are. So in Brazil, like we have trends in Rio. In Sao Paulo, we have an event called SIM, Sao Paulo, S-I-M. And in, in Recife, in the north of Brazil, we have uh, Porto Musical. So those are sort of, sort of some of the principal music events, festivals, conferences that have an international participation. Um, a few years back, uh, entities like uh, Sounds Australia, which is the, the sound, the export office from Australia, uh, British Underground, which are, they're sponsored by PRS in the UK, uh, the Quebec Music Export Office. Uh, they started coming to Brazil and doing showcases for, for their artists. Um, and then as they developed, beginning to do collaborations as well. So they would do like sort of the, the British would do uh, a jazz event here in Sao Paulo, but they would mix it up with, with, a, with a UK jazz artist and Brazilian jazz artist um, and make that sort of, sort of collaboration sort of as, as a long term thing. Uh, um, and it's, it's, a, it's a healthy exchange all the time. Uh, uh, Sounds Australia have had a lot of success here, uh, bringing bands over, uh, finding management companies to work with their artists here in Brazil, and also participating in singer-songwriter sound camp, uh, songwriter camps. Um, uh, I remember the last one was organized through UBC, which is the collection society here and with a, comp a local company here called uh, For Music. For Music is owned by a guy called Nando, and they're one of the principal international marketing companies within Brazil, okay? They work with labels like uh, uh, Beggar's Banquet, 4AD, Domino, and so on from the, from the UK. But they work with artists from France, from Australia, and so on. Their market is principally uh, alternative music, rock music, indie pop music, and so on. And they, they do radio, they do press, blogs, and they also do like sort of, sort of special uh, localized marketing. So like even, even things like posters, you know, street posters still have a space here uh, uh, because they're not so used anymore. Putting posters for, for an album or something in the street generates social media. Uh, so you're using a sort of, sort of analog real world to generate a, a, a digital world movements. Uh, uh, I've got a Brazil market report that I did about two years ago that I'll be able to sort of give to everybody afterwards. And it, it gives all these contact names and so on. Uh, um, but yeah, so the, the, the music festivals, the music conferences are the key place really to meet up with people here. Uh, uh, it's friendship. For me, it's always based on friendship and relationships. Uh, uh, you know, life, life is limited. Um, an interesting thing that happened here, which I'm okay for time, yeah? Time is not, not a, okay. It's an interesting thing that happened here, like over the, over, once the internet started, uh, a lot of the record companies here went bust, okay? They, 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 because there's no longer a reason for them to exist because the, the independent artists could send their music direct to CD Baby and to One RPM and Trattori and all the local dis uh, distributors. So what started happening was, rather than having record labels here, we had the surge of what we call Predator Phonographico, which are independent record producers. So like it's a guy with his brother, who's like, I'm thinking for example, in this case of, a hip hop artist like Emi em, em, em Cida. Emi Cida is the top independent hip hop artist in Brazil. Himself and his brother set up their company 
to distribute the recordings by MEC then. Uh, and so that service where they would manufacture a CD or send their music to CD Baby or 1RPM or whatever, developed a little company which became a, a publishing company which began to have a little bit of success and then they started reaching out, starting to represent other artists who wanted to have their music on CD Baby and 1RPM. And then they started doing shows and then they started organizing shows for other artists. Yeah, so they became like a like sort of a record. It's, it's a whole sort of 360 degree concept, but by independent music producers. So we literally have thousands upon thousands of these independent music producers within Brazil. Yeah. And they have varying degrees of success. Uh, uh, the pandemic sort of, of course, sort of helped kill off a lot of these people because their main, ref their, their main source of revenue was the live sector for a lot of them. And that stopped, so they, they went bust a little bit. Uh, but companies, companies like MEC, this company, they've branched out into branding. They're, they're doing songwriting, especially for soundtracks. So sort of sync, like I was saying, sync has become a massive industry here. Yeah? And a lot of these independent producers are, are focused on moving in on this. Uh, Netflix, and I might be wrong, but I think Netflix last year was the biggest source of revenue for music publishers within Brazil. Uh, it's become massive. Uh, it's sort of, uh, you know, they're, they're doing a lot of Brazil content. Um, but there is like sort of local producers here sort of who are looking for international content as well all the time. Uh, there are probably maybe about seven or eight big sync companies here. Uh, but also some of the music publishers, publishers like Warner Chapel are really focused on, on working on sync. Uh, uh, there's also a company here now called uh, Gorillas, Gorillas, Gorillas Music. It's a, uh, it's a, uh, it was originally a UK, UK based company called Basement, and same thing as well. They're representing a lot of international uh, songwriters and and copyright companies, publishing companies, and of course, yeah, their 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 focus is on publishing. Sorry, the focus is on on things like sync. Uh, um. Um. The live sector within Brazil. So the live sector had, a, had struggled a lot over the last two years, like it did everywhere, okay? They had a hard time. Uh, a lot of them tried to move online. They started to sort of broadcasting their events through YouTube, through Vivo, uh, varying degrees of success. Quite often they would get sponsorship. Quite often it was a local, uh, a local tax incentive that would maybe help them. Um, they're now beginning to come back again. Um, we, have, we have different circuits. We, we have an independence uh, 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 festival circuit. I'm not sure if it's still properly organized, but there was an, an entity called Abrafim. That was the Brazilian Association of Independent Music Festivals. So they managed to organize themselves to have festivals maybe one or two weeks after the other. So artists, both from Brazil and abroad, could actually tour the festivals, okay? You could, you could make this, make, make this, this 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 circuit through them, um, and the there 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 are a lot of them, and they're they're focused on on sometimes on different styles of music, and quite often the either the local music em, embassy sorry music embassy the, the local uh, uh, consulates consulates or embassies uh, have an involvement, or sometimes international export offices will have an involvement. Yeah? So I've seen events like a Molotov Cocktail, which is a, a, a festival in the north of Brazil. They've had some partnerships with Sweden, uh, with Swedish artists coming here. Uh, they, they've done a lot of partnerships with, uh, with uh, the British Council, in, who are based here in Sao Paulo, bringing bands over and allowing the bands to tour throughout uh, uh, Brazil. Here in Sao Paulo, we, we have a, 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 a venue. It's not a word, a venue. I'm forgetting my English. We have a place called SESC. SESCs are cultural centers. Uh, uh, Sao Paulo has maybe 20, uh, 20 SESCs who they organize music events, uh, theater, they record some of the shows, they will have art exhibitions, and they also have things like uh, yoga classes and swimming and exercise, all, all different types of stuff. 
each SESC has its own individual budget where they can contact artists directly, or they will have the national SESC who will put together a big project, okay? Um, and usually what they will do, and we have a lot of international artists who participate in the SESC events. Yeah? And people sort of, Sao Paulo especially is very strong for SESC. People have a, spe a special SESC card that gives you a, a discount for going to the shows and so on. Um, they're really well publicized, especially on social media here in Sao Paulo. Uh, SESC will usually uh, invite a local uh, production agency to look after the whole touring aspect. So they will go after the work visas, uh, help organizing how the artists are paid, and organize the whole, the whole structure of how, sort of how the artist is, is staying here. Yeah. And for example, there, there's, a, there's a, a SESC organized a fantastic jazz event here in Sao Paulo. Um, so there are a lot of international jazz artists come here. And sometimes it's in partnerships with, uh, with uh, agencies in Europe. Uh, there's one agency in Italy called ACAMU who work a lot with uh, international jazz artists. And they do a partnership with SESC. So they organize the, the, the international uh, jazz artists, bring them over here, do the whole package thing here and so on. And it works really, really well. SESC is one of the, one of the, the marvels of, of Brazil. Okay, uh, I'll take a pause. Anybody got a question? I can't hear anybody if anybody has their, their... May I then, David? Yeah. Um, from, from what you're saying, I see uh, two types of uh, tips, uh, suggestions you could make uh, one for the export office, the other one to the artist direct. So okay. to the export office, from your experience, um, what do you think would be the steps for them to, to have more, uh, more operation in Brazil uh, to be able to open some paths to the artists in, in Norway? like coming to a conference. If they come to a conference, do they need to bring artists with them? Or would they come first, start making relationships, start doing some, some um, agreements with a few companies, maybe uh, having, selecting one or two producers and going to a meeting with the SESC people, uh, what would be your advice for the export office, like the steps for them to make it easier for the artists to come after? Okay. So I, I, I sort of, I, I'll, I'll take the case of uh, Sounds Australia. I've always been a, a big fan of uh, Millie from Sounds Australia. She came here, the first year she came here, she came to the Virada Cultural. The Virada Cultural is a weekend event that happens in Sao Paulo and it's live music uh, paid for, sponsored by the local, the local city council and it's basically all over the city and it'll be happening here in Sao Paulo, like, I think maybe in two weeks. Uh, it's free music all over the city uh, with free stages set up and every stage might have a, have a certain theme. Uh, the artists are selected by a local team of curators and you'll have local artists and international artists so Millie, Millie came to this event first of all just, just to sort of feel as well how big Sao Paulo is uh, how knowledgeable the, 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 the local uh, public are of international music uh, she would see bands sort of sort of people singing along to bands who are performing in English uh, um, she did some interesting things like she she also met up with um, local video producers. Uh, like I say, you know, Luciana said as well, Spotify and YouTube, they, they are the number one methods of streaming in Brazil. Um, everybody focuses a lot on streaming, uh, but very few people actually, and sort of, you know, very, very few people actually sit down with, with the, the video producers in Brazil. Um, there are guys who work with, with sort of, who are doing the video production for local Brazilian country music and funk music. Uh, and they're 
that's become like a, 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 a factory. They're, they're pumping out videos every week, okay? Sort of, especially within the funk industry. The funk industry, they, they release a track on Monday. If it's not a success by Thursday, they're on to the next track. And it has to have a video clip as well with. So it's very, very, very well oiled. Yeah? But so, yeah, if, if you're coming to, it is, first of all, it, it is important to come to Brazil. You have to have feet on the ground. Yeah? You have to be here, meet the people, work out sort of, and have, or establish relationships and friendships with people. Yeah? But the, the question is, do you think the export office could do that job first and then bring artists or the artists have to come? I think the first is for the export office to come by themselves and meet up with the people and establish those relationships, uh, see who the people are um, and get a feeling of, well, so what type of music can we work with here? Uh, like, I was saying, like Alejandro was talking about music from you know, Spanish speaking language. Uh, you know, a lot of people would think, oh, okay, it's Brazil, Latin America, let's send them music in Spanish. Um, um, there, you know, there, there is a little space for it here, but sort of have to identify where and how uh, it can be done. Uh, um, so yeah, the first step is, is, is the export office by themselves come here to at least one or two events and make, make those relationships. The second is, it does have to be at least a three-year project. Uh, it can't be, and I've seen so many, so like, like, you know, I've seen people make the mistake and then learn, especially like with the UK. The UK would come here with record companies uh, looking to do licensing deals immediately, and it wouldn't happen. Um, uh, so you need to have a good mixture, like sort of those people who, who, who come from both sort of the the record recorded music industry and the live music industry and there are there, there is space for both of them uh, um, it's also worth having if you are bringing artists going to start bringing artists over here also good for the ego to have have local brazilians involved in the curating uh, for some of the local brazilian management companies to listen to these artists and say okay i know where, where we can put these guys we know we know how they can work uh, um the the event that sounds australia did with ubc and for music the songwriting camp that was a very pop popular event i think they actually did, did it over two years um, so that worked really, really well um, um i've seen people as well come over and they've directly had meetings with with spotify and youtube and deezer uh, uh, to try and at least begin to have a relationship with them. Uh, um, I know quite often when I've been giving international music to companies like Spotify here, they kind of go, well, well, like, why, is, why is this Brazilian company promoting international music? Uh, so it is, I remember like sort of uh, that company, Cooking Vinyl from the UK. Cooking Vinyl, they came here and they spent the week having meeting with everybody from Napster, to Spotify, yeah, to start having those relationships. So that at least sort of, sort of these companies can begin to, know, to understand what type of music Cooking Vinyl was releasing from the, from the UK. Um, it's more difficult, but to sort of, you know, sit down also and work out uh, some type of partnership with some of the companies who are involved in doing marketing and promotion through social media. Uh, uh, we have companies here like Jangada. Uh, there are a number of independent promotion companies who are who are you know, representing artists long term and doing a lot of promotion with them on social media. I haven't really seen a lot of this happening with international artists, unless it's a priority from the majors. But it would be at least good yet yeah, to be able to sit down, sort of for the export office to sit down and talk with these companies like Jangada. Do you, do you think that could work, like hiring a digital marketing company in, in Brazil to start working an artist and then see where this artist more uh, listen, heard and like the region where the artist more 
start getting some statistics before investing on traveling even, to the country, even, for example. Even, even if it involves sometimes doing it wrongly. Because uh, mm -hmm. at, at least mm -hmm. you find out, okay, this doesn't work. Uh, you know, I've, I've tried so many things, released so many albums by different artists that you think are going to work. And sometimes it doesn't work, either because, directly because of the music, not because it's bad music, but it's just the wrong moment, or because you, your campaign was just not properly focused on where it should have been focused. Uh, you know, it's the experience. Uh, involves money, yeah, especially like for, for the export office. It does involve making an investment. Um, and it does have to be long term. Uh, it's not going to happen coming, trying to make an impact and then going home and saying, thank you. Thank you very much. We did very well. That's something we, we learned for, as well from, our, from the, the local Brazilian export office. Uh, that if we didn't have continuity, we didn't make an impact because somebody else would move into our space. Uh, we all would have to think like sort of, you know, we, you know, we're, we're, we're all competing for limited amounts of space. Uh, uh, and so we have to, you know, we have to have to have a little bit of money to invest, but we have to have those, 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 those friendships and, and networks operating. Uh, it, might, it might sound ridiculous, but I'm, I'm a big believer in, in, in the whole thing of networking and friendship. Uh, I think that's sort of, sort of how the, how you can reach out and promote and market sort of new and different artists. And like, if you have a friend here, whatever, they'll say, nah, this music is crap. This is just not going to work here. Sorry. Someone who have the honesty to say that. Or because, you know, there are lots of sharks here as well who will say, oh, okay, pay me X amount of money to do marketing and promotion for you. They'll take your money. They'll, they'll get, get your, 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 your song reviewed in some of those sort of paid for sort of sites and blogs. And but there's no long there's no long term no, no long term impact. Uh, so yeah, they gotta come here. They gotta come here. It is, it is gotta be yeah. Their feet on the ground. Come here by themselves the first year. Meet up with the people. Come to maybe at least two events during one year, and then focus on putting together at least a three year event. Uh, how about uh, artist relationship, for example, a artist from Norway that sings in English? And this is a question I would like to, to ask the, the audience. Um, a artist from Norway speaking in English and he finds on the internet, on his Spotify channel, he finds an artist that, uh, that he relates to, like an artist that he could the, the music is similar, they have the same vibe or they speak to the same public. Uh, have you seen anything like that happening? Like these artists getting together, starting a relationship online and starting a collaboration and trying to export their music to hands, uh, to a uh, online before jumping into each other's country. I've, I've, I've seen a local case of, we have, we have a singer, a soul singer here in Sao Paulo called Flavia K, Flavia K. Flavia is kind of like sort of like a Sade style of music. And she comes from a hip hop background. Um, she's, she's released one album, sings in Portuguese, also sings in English. While the pandemic was going on, she began to focus on doing small little sh live shows on the internet. Um, and a U.S. hip hop artist clicked like, who uh, uh, sort of sort of saw her by 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 coincidence. And so she reached out to the artists. They've now recorded together. They've done a video together in separate countries. So that sort of each one was in its, its own separate country. Uh, based on that, Flavia now has her album being released in in uh, Japan. Uh, it's been licensed to Japan with this track on it. Uh, it will be released at the moment only on CD in Japan. Um, but sort of the same story with this George Versilo and Lee John. Um, Lee John reached, so somebody told Lee John that George Versilo had a similar tone of voice. Uh, Lee listened to George, liked his music, sent him an email uh, and said, look, I've got this song here that I, in, in English. I read that it's already been released maybe two, three years ago. I would love to see you performing part of it in Portuguese. Uh, and they did it. You know, they've, they've never met. 
Uh, everything was, was done separately, each one in their own studio, each one in their own country. Um, it was recorded at about a year and a half ago. And now that we're going to start releasing it, the machines are starting to work and we're working at, well, where can we tour? Uh, what, other, what other activities can we, can we record with this event? Uh, for example, Lee John, he's just did a documentary on the growth of uh, black music in the UK. So we're working on, on bringing Lee to Brazil uh, to do seminars on the history of the development of black music within the UK. Uh, because we know that he's, he, he has himself, as a singer songwriter, he hasn't got a big public in Brazil. So we're looking at different ways to, to have him coming in. But yeah, these are cases of artists who haven't even physically met each other ever, but they see each other online and they contact and reach out and start working together. Um, okay. Anything else one, you want to add? Uh, let me take a breath and think of the other ones. Uh, uh, also, the, the, so the other thing as well is that it's important to remember um, uh, the top music in Brazil, Brazil has a lot of local regional folk music, okay? And it's that regional folk music that takes off every, every now and then and becomes popular music. So Brazilian Sertonesia music, country music, that was originally uh, a localized regional music from the interior of Sao Paulo. Uh, funk music. Uh, it, was, it, was in, it was influenced by Miami bass in Miami. Uh, it began to grow in Rio de Janeiro a few years back. And now it's become the number one, number two musical style in Brazil. Um, but we also have like sort of, you know, they're, they're all, <coughs> sorry, there are you know, heavy metal music, hip hop music, trap music, uh, rock, indie music, and so on. They're all, they're, they're, there are the spaces for all this type of stuff. Uh, one segment that is really, really growing and is really important is the gospel music market. Uh, I don't know how many people sort of are sort of religiously inclined and so on, but the gospel music here is now massive. And there is, I've, I've seen like in the case of Canada, our religious artists, religi religious music artists, can, you know, gospel music artists from Canada now reaching out to, <coughs> sorry, to artists, religious gospel music artists in Brazil and beginning to work out same thing if they can sort of um, do any, 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 any crossover projects, collaborations. And gospel music is an interesting sector because gospel music embraces all styles of music, whether it's hip hop or rock or whatever, there is a, um, there is, there is a, there is a, 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 a link there. I'd be interested in finding out what everybody else does here, like sort of who's doing rock or jazz or who's a management company or whatever. You know? So at least we can sort of begin to sort of focus on, on individual necessities. Who's going to be first? Yeah, to say hello? That, that's a, a good idea. I, I just wanted to welcome Alice, Alexandre Wesley, Thiago Andrigo and Renata Gomes from the next panel. They're already here. So before we jump to the next conversation, it would be great to, to meet the audience, see who you are, what type of music you, you perform, and what goals would you want to have in a career in, in Brazil, for example, exporting your music to Brazil. Who wants to start? Catarina. Yeah, who wants to start? start. Sure, I can start. Hi, I'm Katrina. I'm Danish. I'm speaking from Copenhagen. Um, I went to Brazil uh, four years ago with a band and I'm in the kind of alternative uh, genre. Um, so I'm speaking as an artist, but I am taking over a bit of the kind of booking management situation of some of the bands. So that's why I'm here today. Um, yeah, so I actually, I have a question on, on that note, David, you mentioned a festival or a music conference with a um, focus on alternative genres and I didn't really get the name, so maybe you could write it in the chat or something, uh, just to make sure I got that. Um, I think just, it's... Just, so who, who, who brought you to Brazil? How did, how did your trip to Brazil come about? 
Yeah, so I was playing and had a residency in uh, in Sao Paulo at a festival called Festival Musica Estranha. It's okay. arranged by oh, Tiago Curry. Yeah, um, it was it was a good experience, and I feel like there is um, there are some errors already pointing back to Brazil. So I have a feeling working with the Goethe Institute also, um, which is German and one of my projects is based in, in Berlin. So I have a feeling that there are some paths already leading back to Brazil, which is um, why I'm of course interested. It's a long journey and you feel like you want to go and really have um, have have made the, the, the prep, like done the, the work before you go. So it's not, um, uh, yeah. You guys are thinking, yeah, because I sort of, the. The Musica Estranha Festival is like a niche within a niche. It's it's very very <laughs> abstract, yeah. But they 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 do like uh, Tiago from from the festival does have a lot, a lot of uh, partnerships going on with uh, with the Sesks, and he's also worked with like I mentioned this company Akamu from Italy. Mm -hmm. Akamu have worked a lot with like in São Paulo we have a very interesting scene going on with bands like Meta Meta and uh, uh, Kiku Danucci who, who perform at, at uh, Music Estranha but they, they do a lot of collaborations and projects with, uh, with the Sesks yeah? and yeah now knowing the type of music you work with. Brasilia as well also has an interesting little scene. Uh, in in Brasilia there's, there's an event called Goma I think it's called Goma, 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 I remember. Uh, but we've worked there with a band there called uh, Satanic Samba Trio, who are a very experimental jazz for hall punk band. Uh, they, they've performed in a lot of festivals in Europe. it will be worth hooking up with them to see what type of collaborations and contacts and so on. I'll, 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 I'll write the names down here. Thanks a lot. Fairly. Hello, David. How are you? Nice to meet you. Um, I'm from Argentina, uh, but I'm living in Denmark, in Copenhagen, and I'm working at Stellar Trigger Marketing, which is sort of a part of Stellar Music, uh, which is a management uh, of artists and then also a record label. Uh, and I'm in charge of uh, the Latin American market, and we do marketing campaigns for artists that want to penetrate the Latin American market. Um, so we work a lot with with Brazil and Mexico and sort of the trigger cities that we call based on a on a study made by by Chartmetric. I don't know, maybe you know that company. Um, so we 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 work in the in the trigger cities, which is uh, which are the, for example, Buenos Aires in Argentina, Santiago, Chile, and uh, sort of the big populations uh, cities from from the big countries in Latin America. And you, you, you'll be doing what type of activities? What type of actions? We work a lot in, on social media. So our campaigns are, um, are executed on, on mainly on TikTok and YouTube, uh, also on Instagram. Um, but yeah, we make, we make uh, uh, music campaigns for, for artists that want to penetrate the market. We work a lot with, with artists that are doing really well on TikTok and that are doing well in the viral charts at the moment. Um, we've been working with a, an artist called Brent Morgan that is from the US, and he had a huge moment on, on TikTok right now. Uh, also a Nigerian artist called Olakira and, and many other uh, artists in Latin America. This, this part of the business is sort of new, uh, but, be, but we've been working a lot in Southeast Asia as well. We got like really great, um, uh, case studies, successful case studies in, in that market. So it's kind of we're growing the market in, in and the business in Latin America. Okay. Sophia. Uh, I'm an artist uh, and um, I've been um, working with a Brazilian producer. Um, he came down here to record my album or to produce my album together with a Norwegian producer. Um, we met in Norway because he really loves Norway. Um, 
And we made a plan to work with a small Brazilian label, his friends, and uh, to make a um, cover version of a song by Luan Santana. So I translated uh, his song Boa Memoria and we made a studio version and a live video version. Um, but I've had some problems because the label, the head of the label sort of disappeared and um, I haven't heard from him in, well, almost a year now. So <laughs> I'm not sure if he ever had the correct license to um, translate the song and release it. So now I'm trying to take care of it and um, I'm waiting for a response from Luan Santana's team or yeah, I'm oh. in touch with his publishers in Sweden. Publishers, yeah. Okay, yeah. cool. Fair enough. Alejandro. Hey man, nice to meet you. So yeah, I'm an artist from Norway. Uh, I've been an artist here like 17 years, uh, mainly in English and a little bit in, in origin. But uh, three years ago, I started doing music in Spanish. That's why I'm here, because I was curious about how the market is in Brazil, because I know that it's Portuguese and Spanish, so it's a little bit different. But I've been lately diving a lot into the favela funk style, and um, that's really big there. Uh, but uh, I also want to Philly talk. Philly, man, we need to talk. I think me and you can hook up. So that's cool. I have some questions for Philly afterwards. I can text or whatever. Okay. But yeah, so my main. I was just what? remembering actually, there, there was there was an artist from Sweden who sang in Spanish. We released here once called Ricky Martins, Ricky Martins, Ricky uh, Martins. Not, not Ricky Martin from. <laughs> not, not that Ricky Martins. No. Uh, <laughs> He, he had, a, had a Spanish language version of Hit the Road Jack by Ray, Ray, Ray Charles' success. Uh, I can't remember that one. The only Swedish yeah. artist I know that have made it is like um, DJ Mendes. Yeah. I, I don't know if you remember him. But, this, uh, this was a time we, we were working with, we were working with uh, MNW, I think that was the name of the company. It was a big Swedish distribution company that had a number of, that, that, that company Playground working with them as well. Okay. Um, cool. I can't, I can't, I don't own any of them, but I'll check them out. But uh, yeah, so I'm working on penetrating the Latin market and also as well the Brazilian market with the favela funk uh, slash reggaeton Spanish vibes that like are in the same kind of genre. So yeah, that's what I'm doing. So Feli, I sent you a DM, not a DM, but a... I just saw, uh, I just saw. Yeah, right. So, so maybe we can talk okay. later. But it's cool to meet you, you two guys. I didn't know you lived in Copenhagen. Copenhagen, yeah. Yeah, right. And from Argentina. Yeah. yeah. Cool. So, no, I'm a black Spanish now, okay? No, no, later. Let's do it later. We're not going to talk Spanish now. <laughs> sure. So, yeah, that's my story, David. Okay, cool. Any, any of the hidden faces, Zella or Joff, anybody available to chat as well or not? I can go. But Hello, I'm on the other side. Hi. You. Can you hear me? Is it very bad? Very good. So yeah, I'm borrowing my mom's internet. But either way, I'm a Brazilian Norwegian singer. Or I moved to Norway when I was 12, I think. And uh, I just got back from Sao Paulo a week ago. I was just there last week. So I forgot my SIM card in Brazil. This is why I'm borrowing my mom's internet. And uh, I just released a song. I have two projects, Ella alone, and Ella and the Pet Produce. My managers couldn't be here today, so this is why I'm here. And I just released a song in Brazil. We're focused in by the funk and pop and brega funk. We just released a song called Criminal, featuring Shama and J.S. Mão de Ouro, which was on the soundtrack for Michira da Mira, Cleo Pires' latest movie. So I was there for all the free premieres, did some shows, um, recorded a music video, etc. And uh, we're focused in Portuguese, Spanish, and English. So our next single that's coming out in June will be featuring a Colombian artist called Gina Rose, which will be in Spanish and English. So yeah, I'm mainly focused in Brazil and 
Scandinavian sort of sort of way. We're keeping our our feet. Hi, Hamata. I was with her last. I was with her last weekend for us. So I'm excited to see them talking here. But um, yeah, we're focusing those languages, and we have a feed in Brazil, and a feed here in Scandinavia. Criminal War was our debut single. We have a lot more coming on. Everything with some Brazilian influences. So I'll be a lot in Brazil for sure, which is kind of great because I'm from Minas and I want to be a lot there. So that's just great. It was very exciting. We're very happy with this song. You're welcome to hear it if you want, guys. Nice to meet you all. Okay. So, yeah. Thank you. Okay, let that's me. It, that's me. We got <laughs> Skarbevic. Hello, everybody. My name is Christian Skorbrevik. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a producer and a composer, and I also have a label, Utter Clunk. I'm based in Oslo, and I'm currently working on a three-year project uh, along uh, with a Brazilian dance company at the Instituto Cachano Pena in Fortaleza, and along with a German filmmaker and new music. We're working on a three-year project that involves film and art and sound installation. And also we want to release the music. And uh, I've some experience working in Brazil. We play some music, uh, my music in uh, at the TV Globo and a show called Calderal the Hook in performance in Rio. So that's like my only like TV working there. I've also collaborated with some local uh, musicians in Fortaleza and we are having some uh, some art, list, art installations set up here in Bergen and Oslo later this year um, we also hope to have it in uh, Germany next year and uh, we are also going back to doing some short movies that involves like this dance company working with contemporary music and uh, a lot of electronic music elements and yeah i'm guess i'm here to listen and learn more about the industry and how we can take part of this project and and, and expose that to brazil really yeah okay just a, a quick question how how did the link with uh fortaleza come about oh that's a long time ago i've i've I was uh, I worked at a place there as a volunteer at a school called Ediska. It's an art school, yeah. social. Yeah, so they work a lot with contemporary music and dance, and so it's long time friendships. And now uh, later on, we had a chance to do like a collaboration between uh, uh, Germany, Brazil, and Norway. And we have an organization called New Music Care, uh, organizing or administrating that project. Yeah, it's going on. Okay. Is Juna available or Bentis or Jaffa? They're all hidden. No. No. Hello, I'm uh, Bente. I'm, um, I live in Sweden, in Stockholm, uh, and I'm uh, working with an uh, artist named Juliander and I can see that the, he has got some traction from uh, on Spotify from Brazil and uh, it's also because his sister is working with a group called Now United that is uh, become quite big in Brazil and in Portugal so because of that I think fans has found him so I'm just here to listen and learn a little and to see if there is any possibilities to do any collaborations with artists in uh, Brazil. Nice. Anyone else want to jump in? Okay, so let's go to the next panel. Please welcome Alexand Alexandre, Wesley, Renata, Thiago. Everyone's here. So we put together very, very top level professionals in Brazil from different uh, perspectives. Uh, so we are, we'll start asking them to introduce themselves, starting with Alex Alexandre. Uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon. You guys are in the afternoon now, right? Um, yeah. Good to be here. Thank you for the invitation, Luciana, and 
and guys and okay uh uh I became a, a music uh, executive in the early 90s and uh, when we were at the top of our game, at least we thought we were at the top of our game then. Um, I worked for MCA Universal, I worked for Warner, um, served as um, um, head of Market International, uh, domestic. Uh, in both companies I worked as uh, A&R. I, I was uh, uh, A&R director for Warner for about seven years. Um, and uh, beginning of 2010, when the market was going on the other side, we were, uh, uh, we're not, the industry was going bankrupt. That's why, how we saw it. Uh, I decided, and we were working for nothing. I don't know, Bob, David and Luciana, you guys should remember this. You know, we were working for nothing. We were working, uh, pretending that what we were doing was achieving something, but it was nothing because the uh, the game was completely different than what was what, what we were doing. Yeah, um, people were people were delivering songs for free. Nobody was. People were delivering anything. CDs yeah. for free. CDs had no values then, and we were mm -hmm. still. Uh, on the manufacturing CDs scheme, you know, we, we weren't, uh, you know, thinking of music the way that we do today, I think. Uh, uh, I then decided to move. I, I stepped out the, the recording industry. I moved to uh, the other side. I went to the show business, uh, beginning doing uh, 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 booking, uh, independent booking for uh, uh, festivals. Um, uh, eventually, I got hired by uh, Time for Fun, which is, which was then the number one music promoter, concert promoters in South America. Um, I, I, I did festivals then, there, Lollapalooza Brazil for several years, Veneta Terra, EDC, uh, lots of, uh, of, of stadium festivals and shows. Uh, I, I, I also did festivals festivals and shows throughout Latin America, throughout South America, Argentina mainly. And in 2018, uh, I accepted an invitation by Som Livre, which is the number one independent uh, uh, record label, uh, independent in some way because it was part of the global TV network uh, group. Um, and was just recently bought by Sony Music. And, and, and here today, I, I do all the new business thing. Uh, whatever it's new business, it's in my hands. So whether it's uh, uh, shows and, and proprietary festivals, we have several of them. We, we sell shows of our artists, we do sponsorships, we do uh, uh, agency for some of our acts. Uh, we do all sorts of if, well, uh, 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 videos, films, uh, uh, even shows in hotels we do. So we do all kinds of different types of projects. So to check the market and see what's going on, keeping us alert. I think that that's the new, the new thing that the record labels, uh, the most important thing that the record labels learn from what we've lived, which is you have to be, you have to look everywhere. You have to diverse, you have to uh, be on top of this game now because it's uh, artists, deserve to be served in in all the ways that we can i i don't we don't use the image of a, an artist 360 for a company we instead we use the image of a company that's 360 to its artists and and that's exactly in the position that i am today so livre works mainly with brazilian artists right brazilian it works exclusively with Brazilian artists. Brazilian artists. Uh, yeah. Okay. Thiago, please introduce yourself. Everybody, good afternoon. My name is Thiago. I apologize for any bad connection. I'm in a hotel room in Rio for a few meetings here. So if something goes wrong, I apologize. Uh, well, my, uh, I have like two different hats in the music industry. On one side, I run a law firm specialized in entertainment. I represent some of the major acts here. Uh, just to 
to name a few that maybe you're familiar with, Pablo Vitar, Gloria Groove, which are like the main artists in the LGBTQQA plus um, artists, like they're very uh, famous here, some rock acts and, and some other, you know, labels and, and uh, many music companies, producers, writers, and etc. And on the other hand, I am partner on, on uh, um, we would like to full service agency, but mainly to management. Uh, but we are also a booking agency, a label and a publishing company. Uh, we manage a few acts here, trying to, you know, uh, uh, get the best opportunities in the market here. And for some specific projects, we also try to uh, develop them in the international market. Uh, and that's the, uh, I think, the experience I, I want to share with you guys uh, that, was, that I had a hard time trying, you know, to export to uh, projects. And maybe with that experience, uh, you guys can have some shortcuts, you know, to explore the Brazilian market. Does your company uh, works with international artists eventually? <clears throat> yeah, in, in, in some, some uh, types of exchange and partnership programs. So we, we can help, you know, some international acts to develop here also. That, that's, that's one of the key things I think we, we should uh, talk a little bit about. Good. Renata. Hi, everybody. Nice to meet you. I'm glad I could join this panel. Originally, you would meet Chris Falcão. And the good thing is that she's excited and she's here in spirit, not in body or virtual image. But the good thing is that I am here and I'm thrilled to meet you all you guys and different artists and professionals. Uh, my journey in the music industry started something like 25 years ago and I've been in many different segments in music. I started as an executive in the musical instrument industry. Fender, Ibanez, Stama and many other equipments had their offices here in Brazil and I was the person in charge to find talents for them. I was the person who had this difficult task to go into concerts and shows and find the best match for the brands. And after that, I've been involved in another side of the industry. I started collaborating as a um, consultant for startups, for events, and also for music conferences. Um, helping to organize content and as a matchmaker for people and purposes. And it was right then when I and many other people felt that music was changing from physical thing to digital. I was really, really curious about that. I started learning about it and got really passionate. So I again made a change and made a movement in my career and start working in the digital musical uh, digital industry as director of marketing communication and commercial strategies for a um, musical distributor called in grooves called in grooves that is part of the universal vivendi group um, we started here, the operations in Brazil, two years ago, and it's been quite challenging. We've been from zero, not to hero yet, but from zero to 100 labels signed with many different artists and different um, genres, from funk to MPB, Musica Popular Brasileira, international talents, also people who are um, abroad, people who are abroad and want to develop and better monetize their content in Brazil, but also opening uh, space in the Brazilian market that, you know, 80% uh, of the song that our market consume 
is Brazilian songs. So we are also, uh, our mission is also opening space for international artists here in Brazil. So we have a lot to talk and to exchange. Okay, so let's start with you, Renata, because I think distribution companies could be a very good fit for artists that want to internationalize. Uh, how do you see in groups, you just told that in groups helps artists to, to break into Brazil, international acts to break into Brazil. Uh, how do you see the, the role of a distribution company? Of course, you can talk about the in group, in groups case. Um, how could the artists from outside Brazil, from other countries, by having a global distributor like in Grooves, what would be the steps for, for them to, to get to the distributor, to, to ask would they need metrics first? How, how, how does this partnership could work for an international artist to, to start a career in Brazil? I was here listening part of the class, the, 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 the talk that you guys were having and i found really interesting when they mentioned that summarizing like it, it's important to understand the music that that region that country is producing is consuming and it's leaving and when we talk about music it's not only about metrics it's a very important role of course charts are index of trends but they are not the trends but it's important to understand the culture and i think a good distributor it's the company that understand how the music movements start and also how to connect artists to create great content and it is about understanding the culture and connecting not only musical like artists but also purposes when we have artists from abroad trying to break into brazil and they are only oriented by numbers it is kind of crazy because the music here when you open the novidades da semana the, the new music friday playlist is kind of scary you listen to sounds that it's different is really regional and you see like i would never be able to put my music there it's really really sometimes brazil it's the music island here but when you start to understand how the technology also are bringing more content are connecting music here in brazil you start to see possibilities we have this new genre that makes us forró and traditional sounds that is called pisadinha and it's really guitar driven and original elements on it Every time a song, an international song gets popular here in Brazil, there's a version of Pisadinha on that exploding on TikTok. It's like the younger people are on TikTok playing and having fun with music. And the moment that we see TikTok and other technologies, not only as a tool that came to you know to oh this is not music this is just dancing and fun but seeing as a driver of consumption and understanding how people are expanding their time in this post if we can see it that way post pandemic times that we don't have you know full attention for everything we are tired to be in our houses we are tired to be uh, closed we want some movement and sometimes we cannot go outside and the movement and the fun thing comes from this kind of technology that brings you know a smile, a smile on your face uh, that entertain the moment that you understand that music good music art 
can be consumed through entertainment, it's easy to find points of points of connection. And then you use the metrics to understand what regions, what sounds, what type of artists, what is the age of people consuming this kind of song, what kind of content. It's short videos, it's long videos, it's a visualizer. It is like no video at all. A lyric would be more potent for your music. You have to combine all these metrics. A good distributor not only offer you tools so you can see all the platforms combined in a good dashboard that is not only about numbers, but also empowering the way that you um, understand the movements of the market. And one important thing to understand is that sometimes metrics reflect what is happening in the main capitals. Brazil is a very large country, very large country, and we are not a rich country. Many of the regions of Brazil where music is crucial to life, people don't have full access to internet, but there are other important ways and platforms that make music alive. It's important also to understand what are these other tools. When you, I, I'm not sure if you have already heard about a player called Sua Musica. It's a completely different universe. It's not a Spotify, it's not YouTube. It is a player from Brazil that makes music possible. They are kind of making this movement more professional, paying rights now and getting more and more um, professional in the music industry, but it's an important player in Brazil. Radio play an important role in many different regions. How to break through that, how to measure that, how to combine all this information. So the distributor, it's not uh, important only to understand what happens in Spotify, for instance. It helps you also to understand the different semantics of all players we have in Brazil. Spotify, what are the drivers of Spotify? Identity, representative projects are really strong for Spotify. Deezer, what is Deezer talking about? More Brasilidades, the original song, what is Tidal bringing for the musical experience in Brazil? Reso. Reso is a player that is present in only three countries. One of the countries is Brazil. Why does ByteDance have chosen Brazil as a country? And how is Reso working with music in Brazil? Each and every player has different strategies and it's important for the artist to understand how to expose your music to those different players it's not the same thing and distributors are the tool the important tool in the market that help the artist to amplify their voices in each and every one of this those platforms mm -hmm. But Renata, uh, distributors are not labels, right? So you don't have time to focus on each one of your distributed artists. Uh, do you, how do you <coughs> see like a international artist is growing someplace, some in some DSP or in some region in Brazil? Uh, does that happen within in groups? You, you are, you see the charts and you see uh, this, artists from another country is performing in Brazil. Why is that? Do you, do you at in groups do that kind of work or the, or is it more uh, an action from the artist side? Because we see here in, in this audience, everyone has some kind of connection to Brazil. That's why they are here. They're, they're none, no one here was 
told us that oh, I, I had not, nothing to do today, so I decided to jump in this conversation. Now, all of them were um, showed that have some connection to Brazil. So if the artist finds uh, he's performing in Brazil somehow, he can. How does he connect to to the country through a distributor? Is that a possibility? Yeah, yeah. Of course, <coughs> your comments are like gold because, of course, a distributor is not going to uh, have the time to have meetings which it with each and every artist of the labels. Especially in groups, our business model is to support labels. We distribute labels and labels distribute artists. But we have some ways to scale that. We at in groups are really into um, education, to educate artists and labels for autonomy. So we have monthly calls. We each and every labels we have inside in groups and we have many 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 workshops and talks and get togethers we say when we find the trend that is starting or when we want to um, improve artist presence through seasonal projects seasonal dates um, holidays and things like that we get together and we start meetings to develop projects within the community of labels we have inside. So there's a lot of collaboration between artists and labels in order to occupy spaces in these platforms. The way that we escalate this full attention that we would give direct to the artists is by doing that collabs, workshops, talks, um, courses. We have many courses for artists in signing groups, how to use your TikTok to, to your music and the uh, Mother's Day, for instance, like that, how to work your catalog. So we are always connected to shorts, but also to the opportunities that each and every player offer because they have special projects that can be um, taken, that can be occupied for artists, Brazilian artists, but also with international artists. Our, the bridge that we create is connecting our international artists to a potent national artist, and then together they could build a project to present to the guys inside Brazil, to the platforms. Thank you, Renata. Wesley, the part that everyone likes the most, live concerts. David was telling us it's very important to come to Brazil and to make connections, relationships. From your point of view on the live concert uh, side, what would be a strategy for an artist that have never come to Brazil? Uh, how could this artist tour in Brazil? We have to come first, do relationships, all of that. Has have to have a label or a distributor. What would be uh, would be a good strategy for that? Uh, let me let me highlight some things. Well, a couple of things. First, first, what what David said uh, in regards to uh, making friends. Or, or creating a, um, a network or or a, an artistic network. This is a this is an important thing. We have we've seen this happen before, and it's and it's a good it's a good start, and it and it generates uh, results. Uh, you, you you open doors for your concerts, you open doors for festivals. I can use the very good example of Jorge Drexler, which is a Spanish singer. Act. He's from Uruguay, and you know. Spain, Uruguay, and and he sings mainly in Spanish, uh, sometimes in English, sometimes in Portuguese. But his language is Spanish, and and the one thing that he did is is he made friends. He's a very good composer, so he used it to make acquaintances and friends in Brazil. First with uh, Paulinho Mosca, if I'm not mistaken, he was he became very friend with uh, Paulinho Mosca. 
Lenini, and then eventually uh, a gigantic community, community of artists became uh, his friends. He used to be Warner. Uh, I used to work him uh, uh, in Warner. And when I met him, it was in his first concert in Brazil. It was a very, very small club. Uh, it was probably arranged by Paulinho Mosca himself. You know, he was a good friend, so he, he arranged it. I'm, if I'm not mistaken, he was on the stage with him. But it was at, at uh, Mistura Finapi, which was a, a club for not more than 150 people. So he, 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 didn't, he didn't make money then. Uh, he used it for, you know, to, to, to come to Brazil, to visit Brazil, you know, visit Paulinho and get to know uh, some of, of his friends. And, and then he began to uh, compose for them. Uh, uh, I, 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 I used this friendship to introduce him to Maria Rita, when Maria Rita, the, the daughter of Felicia Gina, was doing a record with us at Warren, and he wrote a song for Maria Rita because you know he was so into getting to know the Brazilian music and getting to know the people. It was a genuine interest of his, and, but that served him very well. And 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 until this day, he's doing concerts and he's getting bigger and bigger in Brazil. Uh, and, and and so that, and there you go. This is a very good example when you build this community around you and it works. So I go. Uh, just, you know, just a parenthesis so on Brazilian culture that it makes a lot of sense that you have to take advantage of it. Brazilians are very good hosts. They love yes. to receive and they receive well foreign people. So it, it's very easy for a foreign person to make friends in Brazil. And people, Brazilians like to take you everywhere and show you everything. They, this is really inside our culture. So take advantage of that. That was just a parenthesis. Good, good. That's, that's very important too. Uh, one other thing that, the one thing that Renata said is that uh, use the tools that you can use. Brazilians are very uh, social. It, what Luciana has mentioned is that we are very social people. We like to relate to, we like to, to, to make friends and make your friends from everywhere. And we don't mind if you don't speak with Portuguese. We don't mind if you don't speak Portuguese at all. We're gonna, we're gonna deal with it. And that's, that's a very, uh, this is a very truth about the Brazilians. So you have to use these tools. Uh, and, and, and Renata mentioned uh, the TikTok and, and, and Resso and Instagram is another very important tool for us. Uh, Tua Musica, uh, you know, now it's becoming official, but it used to be a, a, a pirate uh, uh, a channel, uh, so I don't, I don't relate to it very much, but it, it is. It is a very popular channel that serves very well for the north of Brazil. A lot of artists make huge success with it. So you've got to use these channels to connect. You know, this is how, you, you know, music in Brazil is go, it's spreading now. Uh, through TikTok. It's incredible. It's a very, very powerful tool for music and it's, uh, and it's, it's, it's helping break artists in like never before, I think. And it will change the way that we see music in Brazil, I think in the world in the next couple of years. Um, these tools are very important. Uh, when Renata mentions that International repertoire in Brazil is only about 20 or I would say even less than 15%. You know, Brazilians consume gigantic uh, amount of, of Brazilian music, of domestic repertoire. Uh, the good thing about it is that we have very strong and very mature markets for concerts. So uh, uh, if you look at Brazil as a gigantic country, but if you look at these this specific markets like Sao Paulo, Sao Paulo is like, the city of Sao Paulo is like 13 million uh, of population. Uh, Rio is 7 million. Uh, Belo Horizonte is about 3 million. Even Porto Alegre, which is like a fourth market for concerts, it's about uh, 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 1,500 uh, 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 thousand uh, 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 population. So these are very strong and powerful markets in Brazil. So. Uh, in these cities, the international repertoire is bigger and, and it is open to a diverse type of music, I would say. Uh, uh, artists, not only Spanish singing acts, but uh, English singing acts or even 
artists from uh, like Aurora, for instance, from Norway. Uh, we brought Aurora for Lollapalooza in 2018, if I'm not mistaken, and it was it was it was gigantic. It was very impressive. There were there were like a, a, a thousands of big fans of Aurora here. Uh, and, and one could not imagine that. But Brazil is a gigantic market for, for uh, 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 K-pop. Uh, BTS is huge in Brazil. It's amazing, you know, people, they actually can sing the BTS songs and they sing in, in Korean. Come on, Brazil is this kind of uh, country where you can actually uh, break if you do your homework. And, and the homework is basically social. Uh, but it's not only that. Uh, a lot of agents from abroad, they get the social um, uh, numbers they get from the, the, the social networks and they, they come to us and say, listen, I have a big community in Brazil, bring me to shows, buy my, buy my concerts here. Uh, and it, uh, it doesn't work like that. You know, Brazilians like to do in, in interactions on social networks, but it doesn't mean that they will consume the artist right away. You have to do your homework, which means you have to do all these things. Use these tools, break in your own country. It's not, it's not if, if you don't break in your country, or if you're not relevant in your country somehow, or if you're not doing music that's somehow relevant in your country, you will make things difficult in Brazil. There is a, a myth in Brazil that says that, aha, uh, broke in Brazil first, but that's not true. AHA was gigantic in Brazil. Uh, it is still, but it broke in, in Norway first. It, uh, it was a, a big success uh, there before it was a big success in Brazil. So if you are, if you do this, if you're relevant in your country, if you, if, if you have uh, a fan base in your country, you know, and you do the homework, you do the, the social part and make friends and use this these tools to connect with the Brazilian uh, fan base, uh, the Brazilian market for shows will pay attention to it uh, because it's, it's, it's that instant. The, the Brazilian's promoters, or all the, the South American promoters as in a whole, uh, we are all looking for opportunities. And opportunities come when you, when a, you, know, you identify an artist that's, that's already with a fan base, a local fan base, even if it's not huge, but at least it's a fan base, uh, and it still can pay a uh, little money to, to bring him here to do part of the job to, to uh, uh, make it bigger. And, and I've seen that happen many times. I've, think, I've seen that happen with BTS and from Korea. I've seen that happen with Violeta from Argentina. Uh, Violeta came to Brazil when nobody knew that what was going on and she was a big star at Disney and, and the adults were not seeing that and kids are already singing in Spanish everywhere because of, of this girl, Tini Stosso, Violeta, which is now doing shows in Argentina, so selling out stadiums and, and just did a partnership with Anita from Brazil. And there you go, nobody knows Tin anymore. And all of a sudden, I promise you in about three or four months, everybody will be talking about Tina Stasso again because of this partnership with Anita. Anita is always looking for some Latin partnership. Uh, Tina Stasso is a great partnership, so they're doing this together. There you go, one is helping the other and they will, will grow in each market. Uh, I don't know. Uh, what, what else, Luciana? If I'm, I'm not sure if I answered the question. I think you did. We're going to come back to you after we listen to the story of Far From Alaska, because I think it's, it, compl uh, it complements what you just said. Thiago worked and his company worked years ago on Far From Alaska case, which is a Brazilian art band and they did a great job of internationalizing the the band and it would be interesting interesting to know how did you do it and what's going on with the the band today let, let me luciana sorry to interrupt sorry Chad, just to mention i brought far from alaska to lola in 2015 it was a big success there
Yeah, yeah. Uh, um, I, I wanted to, sh to share with you guys, and th thanks for that, Alicia, that I remember perfectly when they, they did a little bit. Um, I wanted to share two cases, actually, Far From Alaska's case and Eagle Kill Talent. Those two bands are uh, Brazilian rock bands, but uh, rock in Brazil is, uh, is already a niche because we have all these local genres that are, you know, much bigger. And those two bands, uh, they sing rock in English. So it's even more niche for, for Brazil. So it was mandatory for them to, you know, explore international markets. So uh, I want to share with you my, my journey with them because you can do the, the reverse way, you know, to try to explore the Brazilian market. So um, when we started the management company, uh, I was, you know, traveling a lot to, to, to learn, you know, on the music conferences. Uh, I went to meet them. I went to South by Southwest. And then, you know, on panels like this, I started, you know, uh, listening that we and understanding that we had a lot of opportunities, you know, because Brazil is like, uh, continental country, we have like huge opportunities, you know, uh, locally, but the world's much bigger, you know. So when when I started, you know, to understand all of this, I said, uh, we need, you know, to try to develop, you know, local acts outside of Brazil. So um, I started working with Far From Alaska, and uh, my journey was, you know, we need to map, you know, markets that make sense for these kinds of bands. So, of course, our main goal would be, you know, the United States, which is like a huge country, especially for rock, you know, it's the main market for rock, but it's also really expensive and really competitive. So we started, you know, trying to find, you know, small opportunities that we could have the band to perform or somehow to get their music to get there. And we use a lot of, uh, you know, uh, social media and, and, this is starting to get to get traction, you know, so and I um, made them uh, to uh, apply for all, you know, uh, music festivals and music kind of competitions that that were available. And they were selected by, you know, many of, the, of those um, festivals. And we, we managed to, 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 to bring them to those festivals. And then the two, two of them were like uh, really important. The first one was Southwest Southwest in the US, and the other one was Medium. But Medium, we also had luck because it was the first year that Medium uh, started an international uh, artist acceleration program. So it was a huge opportunity. So uh, what, what we learned, and, and then they, they eventually, they, they did all the shows. You know, the band had a, a, a very uh, good results with audience and live perform. They, they're really strong live. So, uh, and that made all the other doors to get open. So uh, they did two international tours after that. So it, it was really good for the band and they're still uh, working and developing internationally. And of course this, at some point this involves a lot of investment and you, you, had to, you have to build partnerships. And that's what, uh, the point that I wanted to get. Uh, as Alexandre said, as David said, and probably uh, Lucian also, you, you know, the music industry is made uh, of a network and the relations you build with artists and in the music industry. So it's really important for you to have, you know, local support. So to build the, those relations. So my, the first step is understand a little more about the market, Brazil or Argentina or Mexico, or, and see if you have any kind of fit with, the, with, the, with that market or any kind of connection with someone there it could help you gain this territory in terms of you know opportunities and in terms of you, you know this network like how uh, this label could uh, fit with my music uh this uh booking agency is able to you know bring me some possibilities of you know doing gig there uh, which is really important to be there on the market at some point i, I don't think it's you know, the initial steps but could be uh, you know the, the second step and try to promote there um I think the first step uh, at all is social media. And once you, you understand a little more, and if you, if you have the chance to come to a music conference or, or be, be in panels like this, you, you're gonna understand a lot of you know, facts and, and, and a lot of uh, little part, um, particular,
Yeah, he's at a hotel it's having bad connection. So you see everyone is telling almost the same things, relationship, 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 get to know the market, get Thiago, are you back? Can, can you hear me again? Yes. So, sorry about that. The, 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 the connection here is very unstable. Um, uh, as, I, as I was saying, so the, the, the first step would, would be, you know, uh, social network and trying to have, you know, partnerships here. Uh, after that, if you have, you know, a little money, then you can have like some PR to that to, for, for the specific outlets. So you, you, you get a little more. And then if you're able to come and, and, and try to, to play here, it's really important. So for, for, uh, live music. Uh, it's really that's where you really make the connections and then and then you start building from there and that, and that's exactly the way we did with this, these two bands you know far from Alaska and also Eagle Q Talent. Eagle Q Talent is doing is doing really good outside of Brazil so they just opened um, a tour here in Brazil. They're doing a lot of, you know, uh, big festivals now in the summer uh, in Europe. They're, they're doing uh, Hellfest in France, Grass Pop. They were supposed to do uh, Lola Sweden, but, you know, since we're coming back from the pandemic, there's lots where uh, there were a huge fight for all those lots. So we couldn't make it this time, but probably next year. And w with all the, this, this, you know, way that we, we went through, we started building relations and we were able to sign, for instance, for Eagle Q Talent, we were able to sign in with C3, which is a management company, also a big promoter in the US, but they, they, they have, they have a, a management company there. So they're signed, signed to C3 as management. They're now signed to William Morris as their agency uh, internationally. So this was all built through, through this, you know, small connections that we made along the way. And it's a uh, so term, you're working with this, those acts for, I don't know, maybe six or seven years and investing a lot of time and some money to, you know, uh, build this, this way. And, and I think, but I think, you know, it all starts with, you know, networking and mapping, you know, uh, the territory. And, and, and that's not, not different for Brazil. And, and another thing that I learned that I think is really important that, that I mentioned in the beginning is... Uh, it's important to make exchange, you know, to collaborate. So uh, how, can, uh, how can you guys help me, you know, uh, in Europe, in Norway, in, in Denmark, and I can help you back here in Brazil so we, we can develop so those type of exchange programs, you know, maybe a tour together, maybe a collaboration on a song, maybe, you know, so, so there's many possibilities, but I think it's really important to do that. So that's when, when those connections get, you know, closer and, and we get the best results. That, that for just an example of that, uh, I was with uh, Far From Alaska in France and some guys in a band called Dot Legacy, they approached us and they were like, like starting the band in France, but they had a few connections here in Brazil. They, they, they came to Brazil like a year before. So they wanted to, to come here to play. So. I invited the guys, they opened a few shows for uh, Far From Alaska and also for Fresno. And then when Far From Alaska was there in France, they played together in like six or seven dates uh, across France. And they also recorded a live session. Uh, one of the guys in the band, they, he, he had a studio, at the, an amazing studio. So it was a huge opportunity. So they also introduced to many people, you know, on, on the French scene. So it was really good. And it was all about, you know, this, this connection, you know, between artists. So uh, I think that that's, you know, the, the key uh, things that I learned, you know, on this process. When you say uh, social media work for these bands, so you did, you used their own social networks in English and, and sponsored posts to, a certain focus country or how was that 
Yes, de- definitely. Yes, de- definitely. For, for for you know, for rock bands, English is like you know to to export. It's fundamental, you know. So we started you know doing posts uh, in, in English, and every time we had like when we went to uh, Southwest Southwest, we we did like some sponsored posts for you know uh, the geographic region over there, like for Texas and you know uh, nearby markets, you know for for people to to know uh they would be there you know and if they got curious they, they would have had a chance to have a chance to 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 come see the band and and also a little bit after they played in all the territories we also you know pushed some some uh some posts for them to you know with you know footage of the show and so i if someone like missed or if someone was there you know it started getting traction uh, on that specific place and you know we all uh, always had really good results, and of course, w- whenever you know someone uh, over there, like another band, and you you know interact with with this band or with with, with some person, some person in, in the industry, you know, even if it's not you know an artist, it, it all it all helps. It all helps, and, and you know it's the um, the cheapest. Uh, you know, way to work because you 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 don't demand your time. Of course, if you're doing some sponsor posts, you you, you got to put some money on it. But you know, it's mostly you know uh, intelligence. You you got to spend some time doing that, and mm. and it works a lot, a lot. And th- and then you go to the, the next level when you start mm. getting more traction. But but this is like the the very first steps. And uh, how many years did you invest before starting earning some money from? that experience um uh, it was it was um i can say you know five years you know investing time and money but it's so it's something that is, is not you know for those bands it is something that there will be forever in you know in terms of in, in effort because mm. it, for them it's about the international market so it's something that is part of you know uh, it's crucial for the strategy so it's something that We'll we'll be investing and and uh, and the money we can make locally, we uh, we also spare part of it to invest on the international market because this is for those specific bands um, that needs to they they need to develop international. So it's a very it's different than when when you're established locally. You can try to you know develop um, country by country or region by region. You know, like then you can like oh I'm I'm already established here in, in in Brazil. So my next key market will be like Mexico, which is like huge for Spotify. We had like some connection, cultural connection. So then you can, you know, map this specific market, spend some time there uh, and spend some a little money there, you know, with strategy, find local partners. And then once you get established there or at least start getting some organic traction, then you can try to, you know, go for the other country and, you know, focus on that. And then you mm-hmm. go, you know, for, for each of them, if, if for, for like, for um, uh, Latin America, you can do it. Uh, it. It's good to focus on one specific country, but you can do like, because, because of the Spanish language. So you can do both in Spanish. So you can go from Uruguay to Mexico with one specific campaign, but I, I would recommend, you know, to focus in country by country because you're going to get better results, you know. And it's going to be more solid in that specific region. Nice. Before we open for questions, do the panelists have any comments on all we have talked so far? Want to say something, David, about those experiences? Yeah, I just, I just want to remember one thing, which is, uh, you know, networking, friendship, and so on. But at the end of the day, as well, it is business. Yeah. It is really important to sit down when, if you're working with someone, work out a contract and so on. And the Brazilians here will probably kill me, but like, I know Brazilians do not like to say no. Uh, if you're in a meeting with someone, they'll go, yeah, yeah, wow, yeah, fantastic. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Everything leave, is possible. We'll yeah, do and you can it. leave thinking, I did a deal. That was fantastic. Yeah. And also quite often, nobody will talk about the money. Yeah. Mm. You'll talk about your mother, you'll talk about the dog, the football, Soccer. Yeah. and the, <laughs> the money is sort of that fine, it's almost like it's rude sometimes to talk about. Yeah. So it is important to, when you're sort of 
participating in something, be objective. Yeah? You, know, yeah. you, don't, you, don't be, you don't have to be rude like I'm, I'm rude. Yeah? But you don't have to be rude like everybody <laughs> else. You have to sit down and say, okay, you know, so what type of deal are we doing? So I'm gonna send you the contract tomorrow. Uh, what type of money? The money is 10%, it's 15%, it's 100, whatever. And but to make, you know, make it clear and comfortable. Yeah, just, I, I just want to make a point here. Uh, sorry to interrupt, but uh, for you guys to, to understand, David is one of those key guys in terms of, you know, relationship, not only for Brazil, but for the entire world, because he, he's, he's the guy that has all the connections. So uh, David was key for us in the, the Far From Alaska work. So he helped a lot, introduced a lot of people uh, outside Brazil. He, he knows everybody on the, all the conferences. Luciana also... Those people are, you know, gold for, for those, you know, to, to develop internationally. So you, you, you guys got to go to understand how this evolves. So David is, is one, one of those guys that, that is born in this internet. So it's, it's, uh, the, 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 those kind of people are really important for you guys to develop work internationally. Yeah, Renata, you wanted to say something. I was about to say the same thing of David, but as he said, really, <laughs> I'll add another layer on it. It's like uh, network only a net as a network, like you're only asking, 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 and not willing to give and to connect and to offer your time also to help people. It's toxic. Sometimes we are we find ourselves in a toxic relationship that sometimes is not a romantic relationship or a familiar one. It's business. Business can be toxic also. So we don't have to be toxic people that are always searching people that's going to offer me something. True friendship is also going after something and giving something back. And sometimes you don't have nothing to give back. And it's crucial to be honest, as David say, to say, you know what? I don't have nothing to offer that, but as you offering me this in the future, I will offer that and put in the paper. It's also be, it's also part of a true friend and genuine friendship, uh, putting things on the paper and do not engage in projects that may not be positive for both sides. Thank you, Renata. Wesley, do you, any final comments? Uh, I, I don't know. Uh, I, I was I was going to say uh, a few comments about what uh, Alejandro Fuentes mentioned. Uh, in regards to Spanish singing uh, music in Brazil, it works, man. In Brazil, it works pretty fine. It, it, there is a there used to be some type of prejudice. Uh, I don't think there is anymore. I think that this is uh, a, a question of of, uh, in, of uh, Spanish singing acts uh, really, really uh, uh, put themselves into the market. Uh, I don't think there is there is this type of prejudice anymore, especially if you go to younger audience. The younger audience is completely used to, to you know, art, Spanish singing acts uh, uh, for variety of types of music, from rock to, to uh, pop music. And, and, and I think that the, the Brazilian acts are very open to this type of collaboration. So I, don't, I think that this moment is, is is the ideal moment to approach uh, Brazilian acts and to do this type of, uh, uh, you know, uh, this type of, of, of beginning partnership. Uh, so to help each other, open each other's markets. Um, and, and for Sophia, you mentioned something about the music from Luan Santana. Luan Santana used to be an artist from, from Son Livre. He's not a composer, he's a singer. Uh, the majority of his compositions, I think that I would say all of them uh, are from someone else. Uh, I don't know wh where, wh which point you got uh, on your negotiation, but uh, I don't know which song you're after, but you should look at the, uh, 
uh, uh, the, the the publishing part. The, there, there you can get the 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 proper permission to to record the song. Uh, usually, this type of of Brazilian music, the so-called sertanejo, which is our country music, uh, there is this system where the artists they buy the music, to the, they, they buy it exclusively for the music for a certain type of period for a certain period. So. I, I would suggest to look for the publishing, directly to the publishing. You know, they're the ones interested in, in, in doing some type of, of partnership every time, all the time. Yeah, that's what I did. Um, I contacted his publishers in Scandinavia and they would reach out to his Brazilian publishers. Okay, okay. I, I will leave my contact here and in case you need any help from uh, the Luan side, he's not from my company anymore, but but the majority of his albums were released in Son Libre, so I don't know, maybe I can get the, the information of the alpha or, or something that can be of some value to you, okay? Thank you, because I've, I've been waiting for several months now, so. Do you know, do you know what, uh, which company in Brazil they are talking to? Which publisher? The, is, the song is from which publisher? Because maybe we can help from the publisher in Brazil. Yeah, uh, he had two publishers in Scandinavia, at least. It was Universal and one more. Um, but in Brazil, I don't remember right now. Yeah, probably Universal. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, we, we can help you with the publisher in Brazil. Just send, send me an email and yeah, that would be great. Thank you. Okay, so thank you everyone. Uh, we are open for questions. If you guys want to ask anything to anyone in the panel, please be free to do so. Um, do you have experience with uh, soul R&B music? how that's if that's popular in Sao Paulo or other regions anyone wants to uh, I can that? answer that uh, hip-hop in Brazil it's the next big thing to be honest uh, uh, there was this about a few years ago about uh, three years ago before the pandemic uh, we were because because Son Livre is a domestic repertoire uh, uh, label. Uh, we we tend to look at everywhere to look for Brazilian music because we, we we survive on local music. So we need to to dig into whatever is coming up. So uh, uh, about I don't know eight years ago, seven years ago, we were already dealing with with rap music. Very small market, very very niche. Uh, uh, funk music was beginning to become something. Uh, and then three years ago, we were planning to do some type of uh, a, a festival, a, a hip hop festival, uh, mainly rap festival. And we, and we, we researched the market. Uh, we brought a guy called Fabricio from Rio de Janeiro to you know, talk, we, 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 we spoke, and then and he had plans to do a festival. He did a festival in Rio for about uh, uh, six to eight thousand people per day, uh, mainly rap. All the rap musicians, uh, and and that was before the pandemic. Uh, three months ago, this this same guy, this same festival, he did a festival for uh, uh, thirty thousand people per day. So it was sixty thousand tickets sold uh, uh, on two days. Only rap music only local rap music. Um, next month, there will be a, a festival in Sao Paulo uh, that's going to be gigantic as well. We've sold about, uh, I would say, some 30,000 tickets already. And, and again, only domestic repertoire. I, don't, I think there's probably one or a couple of international artists, not even too famous uh, or too big. So yes, there, there are a lot of rappers coming in Brazil. There are a lot of rappers coming from Argentina as well, which is which amazes me because uh, Lollapalooza a few years, uh, like three or four years ago, 
they would refuse to have rap music in their festival because they, they used to say rap music is not for Argentinians. And today you got, you know, kids like Twainio, for instance, which is, he's a kid. He just, he just stood up on, 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 um, uh, 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 the, uh, the festival with gorillas in in Argentina, and he was invited on stage, and he did some type of uh, improvisation. A kid from Argentina, a white kid from Argentina, singing rap. So rap is becoming huge in, in hip hop, and rap rap will be, is becoming huge in South America. Believe me. And also, mostly because rap is not today uh rap is not willing to be only rap the the artists in this area i would not say not even say genre in this area are connecting with many different areas of music what we see here in brazil it's a huge movement going towards to combination of rap and samba and pagodji and funk we have the trap scene that is increasing enormously in Argentina. The trap scene is now so huge, so huge that when you are doing the pitching on the YouTube pitching too, there's there is the only country in the world that does there the trap genre to be chosen. So especially because of this combination that artists are doing with all types of music that that are in the margins you know like here in brazil to get more potent the segment is increasing through this combination can i just can i just say one more thing luciana mm -hmm. sure uh, because this is this is interesting this is what we're doing today here at sound we do we do a, 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 a hip hop festival. We do a, 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 a popular festival, so-called popular in Brazil, a pop festival. Uh, we do well, several types of brands. Uh, when what, what we're looking today is exactly what we are talking here today. We're we're looking for, and because we're now part of Sony, we are looking within Sony. But we're looking for artists, new acts. Uh, from all this type of genres that can uh, that we can bring here and use our platform to to develop these acts, help develop these acts for Sony, use their platform abroad to uh, uh, develop our brands, our our festivals. So uh, we do a festival called uh, pop festival called Festeja, which, which travels throughout Brazil and and plays in stadiums. Uh, you know, in, in some cities we, we go for, for over fifty thousand people, and others we go for for fifteen thousand people. But but it's a big festival in Brazil, and it and it reaches a gigantic community. Uh, we are bringing these acts to small acts to perform in our festival, become known. We can use our festival as a platform, but mainly we can then go back to their country. Um, we are talking about Europe and. And, and North America, so that we can, you know, use our festival now as a platform for our Brazilian acts to play abroad with these international acts. Uh, again, it's an investment. The artist from each country is investing on 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 the other country. Uh, they're not charging big money, even though they locally can get a bigger fee. But they are using it to open the market. This is this is something that will happen uh, uh, gigantically. Uh, that's what we we are all looking. Promoters are looking to this type of mixture, uh, known act, unknown act, developing act, consolidated act, international act, local act. That's that's what we're looking at. It, it brings value. And it adds value when you're looking for sponsorship and ticket and 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 average ticket price. So I, I thought that was an important thing to say. That's very very good. So the people from Music Norway, knowing that, 
reach out to, to Alexandre, maybe build a, a plan, Wesley, to, to bring to a pipeline, like to have some uh, ex from Scandinavia to showcase to you and, and see if some of, of them can fit this project. Could be a, a so nice I just, I posted my, my, my email address here. So please, please be free, feel free to send me uh, emails, whatever guys, you guys need. Okay, well, thank you, Wesley, Thiago, David, Renata, everyone in the audience. Uh, Rosa, I want to say last words. I just have to say thank you so much. This was so uh, insightful. I think also it was very, very interesting that a few people in the, in the participating could connect with one another also. I've already got some messages, people, emails and contact info and uh, the things you guys have mentioned have been, um, yeah, I think there will be some follow up uh, based on this session that you guys uh, had for us. So I really just want to thank you guys and, and um, yeah, thank you so much. This learned so much. I've been taking lots of notes on my phone here. <laughs> thank you. It was a great pleasure for us to, to be here with you guys. Okay. Okay. I think that's it. Thank you. Yeah, Have a nice everyone. evening, everyone in Europe. And thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.